Hi, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And um, Sam wanted to know some things about what his dad used to do back yes. in the last century. So you've met over a thousand Scientologists. I have. So yeah. you claim. Yeah. Who was the craziest Scientologist? It's not simply a claim. I have met more than a thousand Scientologists. <laughs> do you want me to name them all? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll see you later. Um, the craziest Scientologist I've ever met, without any doubt, and bear in mind that I didn't meet Ron Hubbard, <laughs> yeah, yeah. without any doubt, was Captain Bill Robertson. Mm. And it came about this way. I was involved in Scientology from um, December 1974 to October 1983. During that time, I did six of the so-called major counselling or auditing courses. I was a Dynetic Auditor, a Method 1 Auditor, a Class 2 Auditor. Um, I did the Data Series Evaluators course, which was meant to be the highest level of logic that anybody could attain on planet Earth. And um, I had done the f right through clear to the fifth of the OT levels, uh, the operating mm -hmm. Thetan levels, where you're meant to be able to float about outside your body and make things happen. I uh, haven't met anybody yet that could do this, but... Mm. I mean, your test of putting a bit of foil on the table and telling them to move it an inch is very good. That's right. I used to do that when I was, if I was giving a talk, I'd put a little bit of tin foil on the table and say, you know, if there are any Scientology um, operating thetans in the audience, all you have to do is move the tin foil a centimetre. That's if you work mm. in metric or um, just on five eighths of an inch, I oh. will say. Yeah. An, in <laughs> an inch if you're working in imperial. Um, it never happened. James Randi put up a, a million dollars that he would give away to anybody that could um, pass his mm. psychic test. And in the end, he withdrew the money. He just got bored waiting for <laughs> 20 years or something. Um, so uh, come September 1982, I was very worried about Scientology. It, it was getting very aggressive. Mm. A young man called David Miscavige had suddenly appeared and said he was tough and ruthless. I don't mind being tough. Tough's a good thing in this world. Ruthless... Uh, not having any mercy, that's not permissible mm. to me. And the guy that Hubbard had named as his successor, uh, quite clearly, David Mayo, was suddenly thrown out. And we had this directive called Story of a Squirrel. A squirrel being somebody who misapplies Scientology in some way. And in this Story of a Squirrel, there was a quotation allegedly from Lafayette Ronald Hubbard, uh, the founder, the commodore, the source of Scientology, which said... Mayo was the bird dog in the control room. And it indicated that for the 20, 25 years that Mayo and Hubbard had worked together, that Hubbard hadn't noticed that David Mayo was a suppressive person with other and evil intentions. Mm -hmm. What I thought was that somebody had taken Scientology over, Hubbard was either dead or missing, um, and the end of September 1983, I, I wrote a one-page list of questions. Each one had a policy reference, a Hubbard reference, um, which is basically saying this policy isn't being followed. Mm. Uh, for the third time in nine years, only the third time, I was reported to the ethics section. And Ron Hubbard said, you can always tell who the suppressive people are because I have the really fat ethics files. Well, mine was teeny-weeny. Um, and... I was a bit surprised because it was my doctor who'd reported me to oh, ethics, you know, my medical doctor who was a Scientologist. Yeah. Um, I won't name her here. And, you know, that was me. I started questioning. At 9.30 in the morning on, I think it would have been about the 15th of October, I was woken. I, I have, as you know, a delayed sleep-wake phase, so as do many people. Um so as did Ron Hubbard and as David Miscavige seems to have, but we don't share anything else in common. I'm not from Philadelphia, for example, like David Miscavige. Um, I normally wake at about noon and it was 9.30 in the morning. There was this guy standing by the bed and he was saluting me. And that was a bit worrying. There was a guy called Bevan Priest who would later tell me he'd been in the SAS, the Special Air Services, the crack mm. unit of the British military, or one of them alongside the special boat squadron, we mustn't forget them. Um, and he stood there saluting me. He called me Sir, which yeah. always goes down well, you know, yeah. and uh, not really. 
And he said that there was an event uh, on the 18th of October at the Crown Hotel in East Grinstead where um, former members of the Church of Scientology would be meeting uh, to watch Captain Bill Robertson. Now, it may be strange, but we didn't really hear all that much about these legends of the sea organisation, that C S E A, as in a body of water, who are the call themselves to this day the elite, though I've not met any of them who are elite in any way, I must say. Um, most of them can barely tie their shoes up. No, that's not true. They can tie their shoes up. That's an exaggeration. Yeah. But I'd not really heard about this guy, and, mm. uh, but I was told he was you know, quite important. And um, Bevan told me that, that he really didn't feel that he could host this meeting, and uh, would I be willing to take it over, sir? And so I kind of looked at him and said, yeah, OK. <laughs> and three days later, well, let, let's go to the evening of October the 17th. Um, I've been introduced to a guy who um, was a professional um, photographer and filmmaker. And, I mean, he did wedding stuff and like, things like that. He wasn't making documentaries for the BBC. And during the evening, I managed to persuade him that something was rotten in the state of Scientology mm. and that it was time, you know, we were going to have this meeting and we needed it on film because that was the instruction I'd been given. They wanted it filmed. They hadn't got anybody to do it. So the night before, I get this guy. And um, what actually happened was he did film it. Bits of the film were available on the internet. And that's naughty because it's my film and I own the copyright in it. Um, and we do have the whole thing somewhere and one day, given a huge amount of money, we might actually release it. Um, we might actually release it anyway. We can claim it. money off the videos that put up clips of We that. can sue all the people that did it. And probably after we spent about £2 million in legal fees and they're all bankrupt. Yeah, oh, we're coming no, for you. Yeah. This isn't working, is it? Um, no, I don't mind it being out there all that much. I think I should have asked, really. Yeah. But they've only got poor copies of it. I've got the original. Because mm. after the guy had filmed it on October the 19th, he came to me, he gave me the tapes, he said, I'm going back to Scientology. <laughs> so uh, it was only by pure luck. So it's this is a recorded thing. This is a piece of history. Mm. It really is. The 18th of October, 1983. Captain Bill delivered a series of talks. He was accompanied by a man called John Caban who was supposedly an OT7, at that point the highest level you could attain in Scientology, and ran a kind of jewellery company, I think, in Spain. And he took me aside and he said, you know, you probably think that John, that, that Bill is crazy, um, but actually it's me that put him up to this. So it's like, OK. And he talked about the takeover of Scientology by hostile forces, and he announced the... Um, new Civilization Game and the Free Zone. During the course of this, David Gaiman, who had been the Deputy Guardian for Public Relations from the establishment of Guardian's office in 1966, March 1966, David Gaiman burst in, having returned from, you know, I would later find out, a program called the CRIMS program, CRIM for criminal, that had been run in um, the desert in California. And he had literally been digging ditches. Okay. Uh, it's a bit of a joke about that for people who know about it because Hubbard talked about the clearing course being like digging ditches because it was so boring. Yeah. Um, then they stopped doing it and they barely ever do it anymore. Um, but he, he looked awful. He looked ill. Um, he, he looked pale, haggard upset, distressed, and he stood up there and he, he, I remember him, he was kind of rubbing his nose all the time, which the police say is a sign of lying. I don't think it is. It's a sign of a, an itchy nose, but yeah. you know, different psychologists, different people. You know what I mean? <laughs> nudge, nudge, <laughs> wink, wink. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he rubbed his nose and, and said um, that we should go another mile with the church meaning the Church of Scientology, mm. which I don't think is really a church, but that's another conversation. Um, look at the word ecclesias and go down the route the and you'll find it means a Christian. Yeah, exactly. It's like calling it the synagogue or the temple of Scientology. It's Cigarette. Too, Actually, is that too? That's a building. Yeah, that's a building. Uh, <laughs> we don't care. Yeah. We don't care. We, we talk all sorts of nonsense here. Um, but anyway, 
church Scientology. Go another mile with the church. Remember Ampronistics? No, I said. don't. And remember. we all sat there going, remember what? I would later find in my researches that in 1965, I think it was, a group had splintered away. It mm. frequently happened in Scientology. There were many times when people went, we just can't stand Ron Hubbard anymore. The first time was when Dr. Joe Winter, who worked on the book um, Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health, rewrote the forward for it. Mm. Um, he, in 1951, defected and set up his own thing. So he was one of the first. And he said, I think Dianetics is brilliant, but this Hubbard, yeah. he's a crook. Mm. So you can read the book Doctor's Report on Dianetics that he was published by the, the guy who had withdrawn Dianetics from publication because he considered it to be fraudulent. That's a man called Art Sepos. Um, so there's Captain Bill. He is larger than life. He is six foot four. Big guy, bigger than me. He's barrel chested. He's balding. You know, mm. he used to be, I later found he was a, a Mississippi motorcycle cop back in the time when uh, the Freedom Riders were going down to Mississippi and disappearing and the cops were covering things up. Um, mm. So, okay. That, you know, I have no evidence that, that Bill ever did anything wrong at that time, but it was one of the most racist places on the planet mm. and he worked for the the, the, the organisation that was keeping it segregated mm. and um, oppressing uh, the black minority. And he then in the early 60s uh, discovered Scientology, um, became m madly involved. Um, he was completely infatuated with Ron Hubbard. And we, uh, the Crown meeting was the first meeting of... Um, dissatisfied Scientologists in the United Kingdom ever mm. and you see me on the end going on the stage with my anachronistic moustache mm. and um, telling them who I am and that what's happened is that because I took this thing over um, I got a title now which I knew nothing about and I am now the chairman of the Operating Thetan Committee UK and I never took that to mean that I was working for Bill Robertson um, because he was the chairman of the UK, the, sorry, the International OT Committee. Mm. And um, my committee consisted of me. Nice. And for, uh, I think I did that for just under a year when Julian Bell, lovely bloke, took over from me. Because I just didn't believe in any of it anymore. No. <laughs> I'd lost belief months before. But I was at the middle, organising things, making things happen, protecting people from Scientology's intense harassment machine. I mean, when we got to the Crown, there were two guys outside, um, Mike Garside and Robert Springer, Springall. It's amazing, isn't it, the way these things pop up in your mind? I haven't seen them for a while. And they were taking our names down on the clipboard to let us know that we were going to be harassed. <laughs> And it's a side of Scientology I didn't know about. This is my, you know, we were kept away from that kind of stuff. I had no idea. And what I'd been presented with a few days before this happened was the original version of this, the Sector 9 Operation Bulletins. Um, and they were called the Sector Operation Bulletins or uh, SOBs, as SOBs. Yeah, SOBs. Um, this was a, a reprint, uh, and it's a bit tidier. The original had lots of handwritten stuff in it, and uh, it was signed Astar Parmegian, much of it. I had no idea what that meant. And um, this actually has a, a little sheet of paper in, which at the bottom, it says it's been distributed by Maria Maloney um, in West Germany. But at the bottom, it's signed Astar, and... Um, that underneath says Captain Bill Robertson, Captain W.B. Robertson. So that's who Astor Parmegian was. These purport to be, um, I, I talked with Bill about it, because Bill hung around in East Grinstead for the next eight months, uh, living with a good friend of mine. Mm. And we will get to that story. So I talked with him often because uh, I was the chairman of the OT Committee UK. <laughs> And he watched, devastated as I drifted away, going, but Hubbard was a monster. He was a liar. He was a terrible man. Uh, look mm -hmm. at all these contradictions and conflicts. Look at these terrible things that the Guardian's office did 
to harass people, to destroy people. This is awful. And I don't want anything to do with it anymore. And yet here I am with hundreds of people <laughs> coming through my door who needed help one way or another. So, uh, you know, a lot of them, I think I was involved with about 80 or 90 people who claimed money back. Um, largely money they'd got on account. You know, people didn't claim back for the things they paid for because that was considered unethical <laughs> somehow. <laughs> Oh, it's so charming. And there was an independent Scientology movement. Um, Steve Bisbee, Morag Belmain, Ron Lawley, uh, Nancy Carter. And then um, um, Bert Griswold. Bert and Eileen Griswold, lovely people. Um, and um, Steve Kay and his wife, Irene. were So there were these three sets of people who were doing independent Scientology. We were told later at Toronto in 2015, the Getting Clear conference, that uh, by Jesse Prince, who was actually running Scientology's auditing and training throughout the world. And he said that St. Hill at that time, the, the local place to us in East Grinstead, had nearly 200 staff. We had the people I've just named, and that's it. Uh, so there were eight people, and Ron Lawley wasn't doing any auditing. So there were seven people active, and they were producing more um, auditing completions, more auditing hours, and more training completions, the seven of them, than the 180 people at St. Hill, God. which says something about the way Scientology is kind of organised. Mm. Most of it's one department spying on another department. So you have an L. Yeah, Hubbard communicator, nice. a flag representative, the Guardian's office, all of these people watching each other to make sure all the money is going somewhere, they're not really sure where. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard left $648 million. That's a bit of a clue as to where the money was going. Mm. None of it was earned outside of Scientology, contrary to uh, his statements. Um, even his book revenues were actually coming through an organisation run by Scientologists, Authors Services Incorporated. So the Sector Operations Bulletins lay out what's happening in the universe. And the first bulletin says, gentlemen, the constraints and conformities of a Markabian society are immense. One is held in position by various administrative, economic and police pressures. The agreements are persuasively enforced through media, peer pressure groups, ostracization of undesirables and the covert or overt incarceration of aggressive non-conformists and troublemakers. Now there's a note for Leah Remini, who would later call herself troublemaker. Is right. It's, a, it's an old idea that we find. In, and this is signed, um, it, it says, M ship reissue by order of sector commander L. Ron L. Ray. M ship is the mothership, Bill told mm. me. And L. Ron L. Ray, and he later does talk about this in here, is L. Ron Hubbard. And his argument was that L. Ron Hubbard had left his human body. And uh, these things were written in 1982, in fact. What's a Markabian? Ah, what is a Markabian? It's always a good question. Back in the 50s, Hubbard did some lectures, which I'd never heard. I mean, this guy produced so much stuff. Mm. You only looked at what was on the courses. So I'd read, you know, 28 Scientology and Dianetic books, but there are millions of pages of, of material, um, possibly millions, certainly hundreds of thousands. He's listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific author of all time. There are also perhaps three and a half thousand um, public lectures, all recorded. And so back in the 50s, he talked about these Markabians. They're another star system somewhere in the Milky Way. And they um, have, you know, basically they're, they're bad. Okay. They're really not very nice people. They're aliens and, and they're out to get you. Um, sector Operations Bulletin number two. There are many viewpoints of the Galactic Patrol, gentlemen. There are. Yeah. One is that it is a police organisation. Another is that it is a war force or space army, navy and air force combined. I'm not sure what a space navy would do, but um, in actuality, its purpose is capital letters, to guarantee that civilization continues to flourish and prosper without disturbance while allowing the greatest possible freedom for the individual. 
What Bill was putting forward was the idea that he was receiving telepathic messages from L. Ron Hubbard, which told him that Markabians were invading and taking over, and that the Galactic Patrol, the organisation which Captain Bill now headed, and the people on the mothership, don't know what they were doing, with Ron, who was sending telepathic messages, the Galactic Patrol was here to save us. Um, Sector Operations Bulletin number three, at point five, the technical and ethical experiment in progress by Sector Commander El Ray is not to be interfered with in any way. And that's by order of the Grand Council Galactic Central. Wow. Yeah, so don't interfere with it. Um, his deputy, this is number four, his deputy Captain Bill Robertson is the coordinating point for those actions entirely outside of the legal structure of the church, meaning the Church of Scientology. Mm. He has a list of all such projects. He did. Um, at number six, we, we suddenly get to mention, then the story here is actually relatively simple. It seems complicated when you come to mm. it, but Markabians versus the Galactic Patrol, Elron Elray, Elron Hubbard, the commander of this sector, Sector 9 of the galaxy, and he's issuing orders from the um, Grand Central Station or somewhere. Where was it? Grand Council Galactic Control. So there you go. What do Markabians look like? Never met one. Okay. Never seen a picture of one. Um, but they assume human bodies. So you could be one. Yeah. Um, you could be one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not very likely, really. I've got a proper birth certificate. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's got my name on it, so. It's got my name on it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm your dad. Oh yeah, it has got your name on it. Yeah. Um, Sector Operations Bulletin number six, the RTS film. Now this mm. is a film, Revolt in the Stars, and Bill produced a copy of this too, which he said was the third draft made by Suzette Hubbard, uh, who is Hubbard's second daughter by Mary, Mary Sue, mm -hmm. his third wife. Remember, he had no second wife, first wife, third wife. Um, the RTS film, Revolt in the Stars, uh, is designed to make several things occur on planet Earth. Firstly, it will recreate the events surrounding a fourth dynamic engram. That's a traumatic event that happened to all of mankind, which affected this sector, circa, misspelt with a K there, circa 75 million years ago. Uh, so this is what's called the OT3 incident or incident 2. It's a big secret. You're not meant to know about it because, as it says in the handwritten Hubbard materials, anybody who's exposed to this material will die within two days. Yeah. You get pneumonia, you're gone. So this is a bit of a surprise that having been read in the materials that people would die after two days, we're now being told he's going to make a movie. <laughs> And that was a significant <laughs> purpose. The, the odd thing is that John Travolta, all these years, has been trying to make this film too. Oh, God. Because he wants they to They should watch. let him make it. I'm sure it makes them I immensely popular. I think after the, popular. Sti the stilts in Battlefield Earth, I, I think... I haven't it, seen it. No. It, there are people who believe it's the worst film ever made. Uh, worse than Inchon, made by the Moonies, or um, The Raid of the Killer Tomatoes. Oh, that was a good movie. Or Plan 9 from Outer Space. It's It's... Right out there with all of the greats. Um, OK, this is an order. This is um, from Basel in Switzerland. All Markabians are hereby ordered to cease and desist. Uh, and he names uh, Zenu. Uh, he is currently uh, Joseph Josef Strasbourg. Um, the German, uh, he's a banker in Switzerland. And that's who Zeno is now. So Zeno is back. Yeah. He's the guy that ran the nasty thing 75 million years ago and um, is apparently running the Markabians now. And like cigars. We get to that later. Okay. Um, and it's understood that Sector 9 is a controlled and protected sector until further notice. So stop it. <laughs> now, so we've now set up the competition. When I saw Revolt in the Stars, um, the, the uh, script... Uh, there are a bunch of characters in it. One of them is Xenu, and it's about how he's going to ship all of the people from 76 planets 
surrounding this planet, which was then called Tigiak, and he's going to um, bring, basically blow up the uh, beings, the Thetans, and uh, with atomic bombs in um, volcanoes on the Canary Islands and Hawaii, uh, neither of which existed 75 million years ago. They erupted about 9 million years ago, but we mustn't let science interfere with the progress of religion. Um, evidence is for non-believers. Yeah. Um, Peter Ford, uh, my dear old chum Peter Ford, has, has written a thing that you can find where he deconstructs the OT3 materials bit by bit and shows how things couldn't have happened. Bless him. Um, so the idea is that this is all going to happen again. Um, and Elron El Rey is out there. He's made Captain Bill, Astor Parmagia, his yeah. deputy on Earth, to stop um, Josef Strasberg, or Zeno, the banker, from doing all this stuff again. We have here Sector Ethics Order Number 5. The person known as Rhonda Wolf, alias Nibs Hubbard, alias Elron Hubbard Jr., is hereby declared suppressive. Okay. It's a bit rotten. That's not nice. Uh, Nibs was quite a good bloke, I thought. My contact with him was all good. Um, right. Now we get to bulletin number 18, and you can go and read all of these for yourself, but I'm not going to read them out to you. Mm. I just don't have the time. There is a game going on for planetary control that has been going on actively for hundreds of years. This is not the game of communism versus capitalism, East versus West, or Catholics versus heretics, or Islam versus infidels. Those games and others like them are tailor-made red herrings and are well publicised and used by modelists and scenario makers to seem like the biggest, most attention-grabbing, problematic, dangerous, involved, revelatory, expensive, fearful and significant games and conflicts around. People believe in them, play them, live and die in them, hate them, love them, try to escape from them, etc. They are very real and continually made to seem so by constant media coverage. So, underneath all of this stuff, there's something going on. Now, we don't have time to read this list, but it goes on for a few pages. It has the Illuminati in it. It has more than the Illuminati in it. It has one, two, three, four. It goes on to a fifth page. And this is a printed list of the organisations we have to be wary of. And um, I hope somebody, I suppose it could go up somewhere on a website or something. It starts with the Masons, has the Rosicrucians, the Middle Earth Society, I think, follows the Tolkien, <laughs> the Golden Dawn, which W.B. Yeats and Crowley belong to, the Great uh, White Brotherhood, which is the um, thing that's meant to be behind theosophy, uh, Mensa, which is the UK group for people of high intelligence, mm. Transcendental Meditation, and Bill would tell me that Transcendental Meditation was the centre of the Markabians, 200,000 of whom had already arrived on planet Earth and they were going to take over. This was in 1983, he told me this. Yeah. Uh, so watch out for Transcendental Meditation, they're apparently Markabians. Mm. The Church of Scientology of California, yes, which was the mother church, the Religious Technology Centre, um, and on and on, the Shriners, uh, the Theosophists, the Anthroposophists, I think he means the Anthroposophists, um, the Church of God of California, the Unification Church, the Moonies, um, just on and on. The Troglodytes, um, the Order of Sufi, Sufis, um, the Priory de Sion, the Aquarians, which is from the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, the Priory de Sion, oh. the Aquarians, sometimes called the Aquarian Conspiracy, which was the name of a book um, written about. Uh, a change that was about to happen in the world, one called Marilyn Ferguson. The Bilderbergers, the Rotarians, the Better Business Bureau, the Council on, says of, I think it's on foreign relations, Scottish Rights Masons, the Illuminati, the Illumini, the Communist Party, the Red Brigades, we get the, Republic, the <laughs> Republican Party, the Liberal Party, which one we don't know, yeah. the Labour Party, the World, Ca world Council of Churches, the World Federation of Mental Health, ban the bomb groups. Uh, Council for Nuclear Disarmament, the World Bank, the American Medical Association, the London Times, the BBC, Associated Press, World Health Organization, the Club of Rome, the Central Intelligence Agency, the FBI, MI6, I think he's actually got MJ6, but I think he means MI, Interpol, Harvard University, the London School of Economics, the Seven Oil Companies, the Federal Reserve Bank, 
um, Chase Manhattan Bank, the royal families of Holland, Spain, England and Sweden, mm. the European Parliament, um, Sandy Laboratories, Flying Tiger Freight <laughs> Airlines, um, Playboy Magazine, Penthouse Magazine, um, whew, uh, Ra Delta Epsilon, Delta Sigma Ra, Phi Kappa Pei, Alpha Delta Phi. These are presumably American university fraternities and sororities. Uh, the Fulbright Research Foundation, the Car Carnegie Endowment, um, the Council on Christian Approaches to Defence and Disarmament, uh, the Stockholm Economic Club. Um, Humanists. The Humanists, yes, watch yeah. out for them. The International Monetary Fund, uh, the Bureau of Economic Research, the Paris Club, um, Cyber Geige. This is only a partial list, it says, <laughs> which includes the groups found in the course of investigation of models and scenarios. So basically, there is an enormous conspiracy run by Zeno, Joseph Strasbourg, uh, out of Switzerland. Okay. Right. Oh, he likes something. Sorry, um, if you as a reader happen to know um, of any... Um, of others. Other, yeah, other groups, please inform your nearest galactic um, patrol representative. Yeah, do ring up your nearest galactic patrol representative and let them know. I think that the Parent Teachers Association at my child's school is a member. The overall purpose or goal is total one world domination and control. No. So, we have some questions and answers. Are the Marcabians, and this is 1982, also in favour of implanting and thought control and drugs and propaganda to keep populations conforming and under control? And the answer is yes. Mm. Um, are they now putting in their form of mind control government as the solution to the wars, pollution, terrorism, catastrophes, scenarios that they created as the problems which have gripped the world with fear and apathy? Yes. yes. Uh, the Markabian Gambit uh, Sector Operations Bulletin 19. About 250 years ago, the off planet Markabians got into the act in a big way by authorizing secretly, without Grand Council <laughs> approval, a takeover project to get control of Earth. And when it becomes acceptable in the galactic community to have it, annex itself to the Markabian system as the eighth major planet of the Markabian system. Um, further on in that quite extensive bulletin, L. Ron Hubbard, body name of Sector 9 Commander L. Ron L. Ray, finished the research and development of the ultimate technical and workable sciences, underlined, of the spirit and mind designed to lift the awareness and abilities of all mankind to that of galactic civilizations and beyond. In fact, the technology of Scientology and Dianetics is so valuable to all underlined sentient beings in the universe, capital U, it will be highly in demand off planet through, throughout the galaxy. The Markabians tried to get control of this resource for many years as it was a definite threat to their plan for total domination and control of Earth. People in Scientology and Dianetics can easily become aware of the real game on both planetary and sector level. Through certain training drills, they become immune to Markabian devices such as Tepaphones and Eckhoff telepathizers. Oh no. I'm immune to them. Good. They become adept at telepathy and investigation and can expose Markabian secrets. So mm -hmm. this is this is where he's going. Now, at the moment, I estimate there are about twenty-five thousand people left, maybe less, in the official International Association of Scientologists, or the mother cult, as I think of it. And I don't mean the word cult in a pejorative way. It's just a group of people focused on an idea or a person. That's what it means in the dictionary. Hubbard was very keen on dictionaries. So the mother cult has about 25,000 members, maybe less. Mm. Um, I would say that there could well be 100,000 members of independent external groups. And... Those groups often use the term free zone to describe themselves. Some of them yeah. call themselves Ronzorg. Ronzorg was established by Captain Bill. And the free zone is the name he gave to it. It's right here in Sector Operations Bulletin 19 at page 12. 
It's issued by the Grand Council Chairman for all members, Sector Zero Galaxy. And it's official decree of the Galactic Grand Council. Um, the Free Zone Decree was received on Earth on the 10th of November 1982 at 10.30 Greenwich Mean Time. It states, as relayed from main ship, Sector 9. Official decree, Galactic Grand Council, a planet known as Tigiak, local dialect Earth or Terra, Sun 12, Sector 9, is hereby declared a free zone. No political interference in its affairs from any other part of the sector or galaxy will be tolerated. Um, so this is what the free zone is. So if you're a free zone Scientologist, that's what, what you're involved with, right? At the uh, October the 18th, 1983 event at the Crown Hotel in uh, East Grinstead, Captain Bill advocated the new civilization game, which is also found in Sector Operations Bureau 19. With the advent of the Free Zone Decree, it became possible for Earth to freely decide its own future. With this in mind, an alternative to the Markabian future planned for Earth was needed. The new civilization game is such an alternative. It is based on the definition sorry, it is based on the definite advantages which would be gained by Earth becoming an independent planet with its own representation at Galactic Central on the Grand Council. Now, I was theoretically, as the chairman of the OT Committee UK, working directly for Bill, but I never met any of these members of this Galactic Council, Grand Council, so that's not really fair. Yeah. So the purpose of the new civilization game is to encourage, assist and or take part in a renaissance of cultural, artistic and social events, sports, hobbies, reading, writing, poetry, music, drama, stage and screen productions and other creative and philosophic artistic endeavours as these best express the values, purposes, dreams and vitality of a civilization and help distributing its message to others. Who may wish to join the game and have fun too. I quite like that. Yeah, it's nice. You've got to watch out for the whatever it was those Markabians are using about their telepathizing yeah. yeah, that was a bit weird. Um, then, a little bit late on in the project, but um, OT Project Bulletin number 20, Sector Ethics Order number 1A. An update of Sector Ethics Order Number 1 written by Elrond Elray in 1967. The being known as Xenu is hereby confirmed as suppressive. So, oh. in case you were worried about that. <laughs> um, it gets that there's a little bit here I don't remember. It's only looking at today that um, in the 19th century, Xenu carried on his plan for world domination. I and mean, he's meant to be trapped in a mountain in an electronic trap, but apparently he got out. And Hubbard mm -hmm. didn't do anything about it. In the 19th century, Zunu carried on his plan for world domination by taking bodies in the Rothschild banking family. The infiltration and takeover of secret societies such as the Masons, a continuing part of his plan to gain insider control, was also accomplished. Now here's the big news. In the 20th century, he and his co-conspirators influenced the exact points of monetary and political power needed to bring their world domination plan to its conclusion. Wait for it. Zeno controlled the body of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the American president in the early 1940s, and planned for the use and control of atomic and nuclear weapons to keep the population of Earth in fear and terror. Just like to point out, F FDR didn't actually use any atomic weapons. No, no, it was Truman who used them. He also gave away several formerly free countries to the world banker financed and controlled Soviet Union at Yalta in 1945. Okay. Mm -hmm. His orders to use the atomic bomb were carried out by his vice president Truman after FDR's death on April the 12th, 1945. Uh, the atomic bombs were dropped. We know about that bit. So there you go. FDR was actually Zeno. And the New Deal, which sought to um, wrest control away from the bankers, who are, according to the Markabians, was a plan that seems to me to have a certain 
paradox. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Um, Xena can be recognized physically, body usually lame or crippled in right side due to deficiency in his energy field. Ooh. So he's got all sorts of powers, but he can't sort his own energy field. Uses a cane or two canes. Bitter. It says sardonic. I think he means sardonic. Lip curls when disgusted. Whose lip doesn't curl when they're disgusted? Has political mannerisms. Ooh. Likes to sip drinks lovingly. <laughs> Hates woman, but uses them to assist political aspirations. Could never be said of FDR that he hated women. He was very keen on women. I um, don't think that To can. the point of being somewhat immoral. Masks fury, sneers, has contemptuous laugh. <laughs> Vicious, cold, fu cold fury, sly, evil, covertly hostile eyes. Yeah, that's really hostile eyes. That's a good one. Can put on social and political graces for occasions. Likes to talk to get his way politically, but he's very secretive about his real plans. Well, you would be if you were trying to dominate the world, wouldn't you? Uh, physically, his body is usually develops a heavy, fleshy, bald, jawed face with dewlaps or hanging cheeks. So I'm okay, right? Uh, likes cigars. Don't smoke. Um, scornful. Oh, well, I am that a bit yeah, about Captain Bill. But can also look worried and hunted. Yeah, you can look <laughs> worried. <laughs> Try that. Uh, shifty. Fun. Sweaty. Mm, not very sweaty. Not too bright. Well, yeah, that is true. Raises eyebrows and cognitions. Um, mentality. Now, here we get into a list of people who are found in... The Revolt in the Stars, remember, the, the screenplay that's going to be a movie that's going to kill off the population of Earth within yes. two days of seeing it. So we, we now have Xenu, Chu, Stai, Zell, and a little bit of information about how to spot them. Um, we haven't got a lot further to go with this, and we are going to have to do a second episode about what Bill did later, because <laughs> that was pretty astonishing what I came to find out about Bill personally shocked me tremendously and I have no doubt that it's true Bill once said to me that there were two things he'd witnessed L. Ron Hubbard do that would turn anybody away from Scientology and I spent weeks trying to find out what they were and he wouldn't tell me but he said anyone that heard this would leave Scientology straight away so that was the opinion of somebody who really revered L. Ron Hubbard this is called the Third World War the Third World War is now in full action. It has been going on for many years. Skirmishes, guerrilla action and small isolated pitched battles with clandestine operations of large and small scale constantly being carried out. You won't read about this war in the newspapers or see it on television because the press and TV are being used as weapons in it. Conspiracy theory always, you know, and it's not to say there aren't conspiracies. Of course there are. You know, the, the royal houses and the banks and all sorts of people, of the oil companies, the tobacco companies, they've had conspiracies. They've kept things secret. They've had purposes that they've not been open mm -hmm. about. Though I think we know the banks wanted to make money. Tobacco companies wanted to do all to die from smoking. Yeah. Um, but the idea that you can have a completely controlled media is one that's that fascinates me, that you can get tens, hundreds of thousands of people to all be quiet about something. Because my experience of human beings is once... It, it, this is something that the um, MI5 here, that's where I heard it from, somebody saying, once you've told one person, you've told 11. Mm. And everyone they tell tells 11. <laughs> and on it goes. So the idea that you can keep these things so secret, you know, like that children are being tortured in a a basement under a pizza parlor for mm. example yeah. it really doesn't work um not much further to go then you get a dreadful poem and i'm going to read it because this is astropomagian in the broad universe are many civilizations only a few require methods of control and enslavement <laughs> what some of them require <laughs> methods of control and enslavement uh, Elwin Hubbard did say in 1952 in, in a Philadelphia doctorate course lecture, we have ways of making slaves here. Yeah. Just in case you were wondering what Scientology is really about. 
All others love freedom, exchange of ideas, free trade and open communication. Cherish spiritual expansion. Let not martial conquest be your goal. Your real power will create a radiant, jeweled planet for the admiration and prosperity of all mankind. Then to the galactic community community as a reborn wonder, not as an enslaved exhibit. The choice is yours. The alternatives have been shown. It's up to you to decide for your own forevers. Wow. So you get more than one that forever. Here. Astar. And we do get one little bit of Bill's rather neat handwriting. Mm -hmm. When I saw the originals of, of some of these, which were handwritten, it looked so much like Hubbard's handwriting. And I went and checked it against as a public published book that's been withdrawn now called Dianetics Today, which had lots of pages of mm. and I checked it and the only difference I could see was the capital A's. So that was a bit freaky. Um, this is the free zone strategy. The entire strategy is to align the Buddhists, I'm afraid it's spelt B-H-U-D-D-I-S-T-S, um, the Islamics, the Japanese, the Mormons, as a counterforce to Markabian models and scenarios at every level of the game to bring about the conditions for a new civilization. And at the end, it's got an addendum, which is the new civilization game, which uh, we won't be playing. No. Um, this is the origin of much, I mean, many independents like the Institute for Research into Metapsychology, for example, which Sarge Gabodi started with David Moe. That was never involved with Bill. Um, so, you know, there were other people doing things and there still are. But anybody that's talking about being in the free zone or Runzorg is associated with Captain Bill. And maybe we should just, maybe we should take a few extra minutes and finish this for once and for all. After we, we met in East Grinstead, I believed this stuff. You know, I'd just come out of this group. I'm suddenly finding I'm being harassed. I've been through this daft thing that, that says that, that it was 75 million years ago in this sector of the galaxy. I've done all of that. Mm. And he took three days doing it. And I did tell them, didn't create any positive effect. <laughs> yeah. And was told, yes, a lot of people find Fine. that. You need OT4. So I did mm. that and said that didn't seem to do anything. I said, yeah, a lot of people find that. You need OT5. But <clears throat> I spent a lot of time with Bill. Um we went over to Spain to an event that he held in Marbella. And Marbella, just the, the weather was great. It's November and it was warm. It's lovely. Uh, and Marbella's quite upmarket because there's nobody there at that time of year. So we stayed in this grotty little flea-bitten pension the first night. And I complained to Bill and he put us into a grand sort of hotel in Marbella because they're all empty. And so we had waiters coming along. We'd just say, Naranja, and they'd give us another glass of orange juice and all of that and he got all of these flags and pennants and all of this stuff going on and there were, I think 12 of us went from England and that was the largest group by far there was somebody from the Phoenix group in Los Angeles there was somebody from um, the Advanced Ability Centre in Santa Barbara David Mayo's group and he took me aside and said we're going to stop those squirrels in the Phoenix group and that bent corridor with you and I'm like oh no we're already at war with each other and he want, Bill wanted to sing songs and celebrate this, this thing, and, and it was all a bit nuts. A guy called Peter Warren came along out of nowhere and said, did we want to hear what Diana Hubbard had to say? Hubbard's older daughter by Mary Sue. And yes, we did. So he went up on the stage and he then started castigating Captain Bill and saying what a suppressive was. So four people carried him out of the room, kicking and screaming. While that was happening, Captain Bill's room was broken into and stuff was stolen. Now, I've no, no idea who did that. I'd just like to say that David Gaiman was there, <laughs> which was a bit of a coincidence, and so was John Chadder, who'd also been a, a deputy guardian um, and been punished as one of the crims. So I don't know if they had anything to do with that. I very much doubt it. Um, who knows? Uh, but they were part of the guardian's office. And that was it for me. I, you know, for a few weeks, this stuff had been in my head and it was just like, oh, this is just nonsense. Mm -hmm. Very soon after that, I got a pile of material collected by Michael Lynn Shannon, whose name should be celebrated. Uh, people keep on insisting that Jerry Armstrong gave me documents. Jerry Armstrong never gave me a single document. Mm -hmm. I got the documents out of the Armstrong case through Michael Flynn on a day when the seal on them was lifted. 
and that's why the world now has possession of the three teenage diaries of Ron Hubbard through me, because I'm the only person who had them legally from the court. No stolen documents, as the New Yorker has asserted. I had nothing that was stolen. Um, but Michael Lynn Shannon's stuff just completely put me off. But it was like, you know, yeah. he was a liar. <laughs> and I've said it again and again, I'm not willing to believe a liar. And that's simple for me. It surprised me that 90% of the people I spoke to took a different point of view. Yeah, he was a liar. He was a bad man. He was evil. But look at this great work he's done to rescue us all and give us these fantastic supernatural abilities, which as yet we can't manifest. Okay. Fair enough. So Bill hung around in, in East Grinstead and he became more and more concerned that I no longer believed. And he told me that he'd seen Hubbard do two things that would put anyone off Scientology or Hubbard. Um, I wondered if these things were sexual because there was also a, a statement going around, um, which I think was Andre Taboyan, who'd worked with Hubbard, and he said he walked in on Hubbard in Morocco and Hubbard was buggering a 12-year-old boy. And um, I said, really? <laughs> so maybe, you know, it was something of that kind of weight I got from the way Bill was. Mm -hmm. And Bill told me about the horrible things he'd done in, up in Edinburgh when he founded the first advanced organisation, the awful punishments he'd inflicted, making a guy called James Stewart crawl across a slippery, steep roof three stories up as a punishment for having had an epileptic fit. Okay. Stewart yeah. committed suicide a couple of days later and mm -hmm. Scientology covered it up. You can read about that in Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky if you feel so inclined. Um, I'd recommend it. It took me six years of work and it remains the only history of Scientology, mm -hmm. Scientology movement. Uh, Janet Reitman borrowed from it lavishly to publish a very abbreviated version of it. And you started it out by writing about Captain It's Bill. true, actually, yes. You remind me, I, I wrote a book called The Scientology War, which was about Captain Bill and the Mark Abians and all that. And I just realised that nobody was going to be able to understand it, so I had to explain Scientology. And to, then I had to explain how I got involved in Scientology, and I've been mm. used as a test case of a friend who... Um, it's been very much involved in de-radicalising and she uses the four chapters at the beginning of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky to show that a relatively clever human being can be drawn into something that's absolutely nuts. OK, the story between Bill and me ends about eight months after it started. I went down into the kitchen and Bill's girlfriend, who as I say, was a close friend of mine, was in tears. Um... And she told me that so she had never had sex with Bill. They'd lived together for eight months. She was a beautiful woman. They'd never had sex. And that most Saturdays, they would go to a, an outsize woman's clothing store, a store for big, tall women. And Bill would point at the things he wanted, and she'd buy them. And that every evening when he didn't have anything else to do at eight o'clock sharp he would stand in front of the mirror dressed this six foot four motorcycle cop in a ball gown with high heels on and he would sing his songs and the the clincher is this he signs the things in sector operations bulletins Asta Parmegian Asta Parmegian is in the Revolt in the Stars script and is female Astor Parmegian is a nightclub singer who is the girlfriend of El Ron El Rey. So we have this other kind of twisted story that's going on underneath this that, that you know, Bill needed help to find out who he was. Scientology hadn't really worked for him mm. in, in, in that regard. The end of the story is very tragic. Bill developed a, a tumour. This is, I didn't see him over the next few years. He developed a tumour in his throat and he refused to have a, a whole wooden throat so he'd be able to breathe and he strangled to death um, don't think he reached the age of 60 um, my memories of him are all absolutely fine but I have heard some awful things about you know, what he did to psychiatrists and how he had people on the roof in the Los Angeles organisation looking for spaceships at night um, mm. but I think he was an empath uh, a weaponized empath he was somebody who was brought to do dreadful things on behalf of a manipulative man 
um, called El Ron El Rey or Lafayette Ronald Hubbard. Um, this has been the story of the craziest Scientologist, Captain Bill Robertson. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm John Atak. I'm Tim Atak. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. No, I mean, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs>